Feedback is always welcome. So let's go. Right. Without any further ado, I'll hand over to Jason. All right. Um, so um, I always sort of like doing things based around the case. Um, but obviously, I guess the first thing is to actually work out why you are all here. Um, and I guess as a general sort of idea, I would think that the goals of this are to sort of get a better understanding of things that you'll actually see in internship. I imagine that's why I don't maybe turned up at the moment. Um, and I guess the, the only thing that I can really give you, I'm not an expert, like I'm not a cardiologist or a surgeon or anything, so if you want that sort of detailed knowledge about something, probably not the person to talk to. Um, but what I probably can give you is a system for sort of approaching internship and approaching some of the things in internship that are going to be new to you and some of the challenges. Um, I don't really want to talk too much about all the other crap like life and balance and all that sort of shit. If you guys want that, we can talk about it later on. But it's you know pretty self-explanatory. Some people will do it, some people won't. You've done it for you. Um, but like I say, everything that's in here is only my opinion. I'm not really expert. By all, if I say something, go and read up about it. And I guess that's probably a bit of a advice for the rest of your medical career because you'll find so many times that a registrar will say something and they'll sound really confident about it, and then you'll go and say it later on to a consultant and they'll look at you like, like you're a mother, like <laughs> So just because someone seeing this says it to you, don't accept it as a fact, unless it's something really minor, then just go with it, okay? Um, and I guess some of the core requirements of internship, so that you guys have an idea of what I would expect of one of my interns, um, it's paperwork a lot. Um, you have to be efficient, so you have to know how to time manage and prioritize and things like that, then there's more paperwork. And you have to be reliable so that if you get jobs, you actually do them. Or if you're not going through them, or if you can't do them, we know about it so we can fix it. 
um, you have to be resourceful. So we don't actually really want you coming up to us all the time asking for the same basic stuff. Like if you're in the end of the year and you're still asking us to do the same camera, it's probably not a really good thing for you. Um, and then you have to be good at paperwork. So you really, I know I'm sort of overstating a little bit, and it doesn't feel like you're doing that much paperwork, but you probably do spend the majority of your day doing some form of paperwork one way or another. So just accept it, get used to it, it'll be gone after a year or so. Um, that makes you a basic, normal intern. So if you do all of that really, really well, you'll be one of the packs that no one notices. The way to stand out, again, my opinion personally, is resuscitation. So what I mean by that is obviously not in the middle of a big trauma call, you're the one that pushes you in the front and tells everyone what's going on. But you get asked a lot of things by nurses. You're the first port of call pretty much between the medical staff and everybody else. So if you can deal with a lot of these things or start the ball rolling on a lot of these things, you look really, really good when someone else gets there and actually fixes the problem. Okay? So that's sort of why I guess I don't need to be a cardiologist to tell you what to do in acute coronary syndrome. Because I've never gone to a cath lab, and neither will you guys, most of you. Some people will be cardiologists. But you won't go there. But what you'll have to do is the initial management. So that's the stuff that I sort of want you to take out of all of this. Like the first 10 minutes when you're alone, that's what you need to take out of all of this lecture series. So enough crappy talk. Let's look at the scenario. So we've got a 57-year-old man. He's admitted overnight to Brownless Hospital, which is obviously a fake hospital, and we've got a name after the Brown. Um, he's had two days history of nausea and vomiting. The only past history you've got at the moment is hep C cirrhosis, and he's on the transplant list. Um, so a ward nurse comes up to you, and she says, so he's been admitted overnight, it's sort of early in the morning. She's like, oh, his sodium was 123, no one's anything about it. Oh, what do we do, what do we do? Uh, Anyone have any ideas? I don't know, I'm going to get a lot of silence, so I'm going to have to start picking people out. By the way, everyone's going to be wrong, so just shout something out. If it's right, wrong, who cares? What does anyone want to do? So 123, do we care? Yes? Okay. Why, why do we care? Is it high, is it low, is it normal? Low, yeah, good. Okay. So what's the first thing you're going to do? Whenever a nurse comes to you with a problem that you deem is probably worth worthy of your time, what's the first thing you're going to do? So I heard a few things, it was almost there. See the patient? I'm going to say you guys said that. Yeah, well done. Yeah, see the patient. So, you go over and have a look at this guy. He's sitting in bed, he's awake and alert. He's complaining of feeling nauseous, he's had a recent vomit. He's obviously drawn just like from the end of the bed, like Simpsons colour yellow. Um, some of the systems, heart rate's 101, BP 129 and 83. JVP's not elevated, dry mucus membranes. He's got good air entry bilaterally when you have a bit of a listen. Uh, he's saturating really well under the air, 99%. Um, he's got smaller sides in his belly, he's in a stage right quarter. Um, otherwise, it's pretty soft and non tender. He's got no IDC in, they've been in AD, thanks very much. And no fluid balance has been done so far. So, when you walk to a patient as an intern, I guess this is <coughs> one of the only real pearls that everyone should take out of this whole lecture series. Look at the patient and work out are they sick or are they not sick? And I'm not talking like, are they sick enough to be in hospital? Yeah, yeah, sure, they're sick enough to be in hospital. But is this the sort of patient that you can spend 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour dicking around on, not really doing much and getting it wrong? Or are they going to crash? So what do you think about this guy? Sorry? Speak up. Why? He's stable vital. Yeah. He's like a little bit out there, not really. Sure. He's awake and alert. Good. He's complaining which means he's speaking. Good. Yeah, yeah, he looks well. So of course, we did get asked about the sodium. So this is what you need to do when you get someone that has a low sodium. I don't even know what half that stuff is for, okay? So don't ask, please. All I know is that's what you get. If you get all of that stuff, a real doctor will come out and work out what's wrong, and they'll be really <laughs> thankful that you did it, okay? And I say, we're like, I'm, I'm like that too, don't worry. So I would have no idea. But really, if you get all of those things at the same time, Okay, so from the urine, from the serum, get all of those, then you're doing well. Okay? They're the labs you need. The next thing you can do is look at his volume state, because again, whilst you've done that, you probably do have to treat him in some way, seeing as we've decided we want to do it. And by the way, all of these I'll give out on little like lecture slides like PDFs, so if you just you don't have to write down that unless there's something you want to add to it. So now we're sort of talking about volume assessment. So what do we think of this guy? As a general Quick sort of volume assessment. Is he overloaded? Is he underloaded? Is he okay? Underfilled. Underfilled. Who said that? Why? Good. What else? 
Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty weak, but you know, that's pretty that's good. Yeah, you're right. So he's slightly tachycardic, very slightly, but at least it's the upper end of normal. We don't know what his normal is. Fair enough. But still, broadly speaking, probably upper end. JDP not elevated, oh, can okay, you not really see a JDP? I don't know, unless it's like up in here somewhere, maybe not. But he's got dry mucous membranes, probably. He's been in overnight, and he doesn't have an ID seen yet. Granted, we don't know if he's gone to the toilet, but generally sick people will get catheters most of the time. So if he hasn't really gone to pee, there's no fluid balance, maybe nothing's come out. Again, it's all pretty broad stuff, but you don't have all the answers sometimes. So just something to think about. So you reckon he's underfilled. So when we do our volume assessment, hy uh, hypotrenia, sorry. You've got these three categories. You've identified hypovolemia, so you give normal saline slurry. Oh, thanks for joining us. Is that for me? Yeah. Is that coffee for me? <laughs> if they're euvolemic, just fluid restrict. That's all. Don't do anything special. Just stop them from drinking fluid. And write it down something, because then you look really smart when someone's like, oh, who have you used? Oh, fluid restrict one and a half litres. It doesn't matter if they go off and drink five litres, because the nurses give it to them. If you've written down one and a half litres, you look good. If they're hypervolemic, then you give them diuretics as well. Pretty simple. Don't be afraid of frisomite. Don't go off and give 900 milligrams of frisomite. I tried to last week. But don't be afraid of it. Like 40 milligrams, 80 milligrams of frisomite IV is not going to touch the sites. And if they start peeing like a racehorse, you just give them a bit more fluid. Like it's okay. So we decided we're going to give him a liter of 0.9% normal saline over eight hours. We picked eight hours just because it seems like a nice easy number. And we're going to repeat the bloods 12 hourly just to see. We don't know what his sodium is yet from previously, so this could all be normal for him relatively. But you know, we'll see what happens. And of course, as we're walking back, there's another nurse that comes out and she's yelling at you. Oh, he's not responsive. Oh, God, quick, quick, come back, come back. And there's no residents or registrars here yet. Um, so you're sort of stuck. So I guess not really much of a guess to work out what we do before we go down looking. So he's lying in bed, he's still drawn to surprise the His GCS is now 10, E2, B3, M5. You guys know what that is, I'm assuming you can rattle off pretty quickly. Good. Heart rate, 107, BP 119, 173. Still dry. Good air inch by that, hasn't changed. But now he's saturating a little bit less on two liters of anal pumps because the good nurse put that on while she was calling for you. Belly hasn't changed, still haven't got a catheter in. So, when we look at this guy now, is he sick or is he well? Sick, well, yeah. So, I had a bit of both. So, someone that said sick. So put some put your hand up for sick. Yeah, you. Why is he sick? So he's requiring two layers to maintain saturation at 93%. It's obviously getting the baseline so that we can get the baseline. So that we can get the baseline. So if there's one thing that's the most concerned about this, what do you think it is? Saturation. How many people in hospital do you see without oxygen? Or more, maybe if I flip it the other way, how many people in the hospital do you see with those stupid medical problems on all the time because the nurse has never taken off? I'm leading you in that direction. Everyone. Everyone has medical problems on pretty much. Like, unless they're getting up and tearing off themselves, the nurse's standard modality is to get nasal prongs, put on a patient, and turn them up. Okay? So I agree with you that it's changed. But the most concerning thing is probably the fact that before he was complaining about vomiting, and now he's GCS 10. He's still protecting his own airway, that's fine in theory, according to the GCS report. But he's obviously, something's happened, okay? And of course, because we know some of the things about hypertrophy and some of the things they cause, we know that they can cause CNS dysfunction, seizures, and things like that. He's not quite there yet. And the chances that he was well so far, he's all of a sudden dropped it, not really gonna happen, but just roll with me here, okay? Let's pretend you saw this guy and he was like this in the first place. So when you get hyponatremia with CNS dysfunction, this is what you do. You get good IV access, because every patient on the ward has shit canyons. So you make sure they've got a good one, okay? I don't care what size it is, 18 would be nice. If you can only get a 20, that's fine. But I don't want it in the back of the hand. I don't want you like going in and back walling the vein and bringing it out and then the cannula sort of works and sort of doesn't, I'm not really sure. Because you're gonna put stuff through there that if it extravasates will cause some damage. So go for big veins in the antecubital fossa. If they're lying down and you can, just put one in the external jugular, like it bounds, like you can see it from miles away. So put one in there if you have to, just get good access. Goes in the first time, doesn't stuff up. Something like hypertonic CNI, should you be asking a senior for advice? Yeah, you should be. So I'm not saying you're going to give this, but if you, so you, when you're getting access, by this stage you probably call for help because you've identified a sick patient, I can't do this on. I don't care what system you want to use, met call, urgent clinical, whatever. You've called for help, someone's coming. So as you're getting IV access, because you're the only one that you trust doing that IV access then and there, 
you've asked the nurse that's with you or someone else, can you please go and get hypertonic saline, 3%? Get 100 mil. Because by the time they go off, by the time they get to pharmacy and they say, we need saline, we've got some on the board, and they say, oh, we don't give up saline. Oh, no, no. By the time all that shit goes on and they come back with the saline, then your registrar's there, then your consultant's there. And then he goes, oh, fuck, you got that. Yeah, good work, good thinking. But this is what you do. Let's say you're, you're by yourself in the middle of nowhere doing a, a rotation portion, and you're alone at night and this happens. This is what you do. 100 mil hypertonic saline, 3%. Okay? You give it over about 10 to 30 minutes. You can repeat it once if you want to, if they're still seizing. If they're seizing at the time, probably give it a 10 minutes instead of 30, because you're probably pretty scared, I would be. Um, and you expect their sodium to rise by about 2 mil mol per litre for each 100 mil bag that you give them. Okay? You put an IVC in, because you want strict fluid balance on these guys. And you'd say that no matter what happens, you do not go for more than 6 mmol per litre during the resuscitation phase, increasing their sodium. If they're still seizing after that, probably not to do with sodium. Okay, so then you've got to start thinking of your other causes. But again, we're going to simplify this down. This is just the hypotrenic patient. And again, you're not probably doing this stuff, to be fair. But if you're thinking about it, and you've got it ready, you'll look really good. And of course, you're helping the patient, and that's all the subtext for all of this, right? But you'll look good as well. Okay? And the other thing, just the word of caution, stop after you do that. So when you give the hypertonic saline times two, stop. Don't give more. Don't give a little bit more sodium. Don't think I'll just run a background bag, you know, fluid, it's fine. Don't do it, because you'll end up pushing it too high. And when you give one of these guys central pontine myelinosis, then you'll look like a real big head. Okay? So I know it's hard, especially if they're seizing, but stop. Just a word of caution. But you called a med call, an ICU came over. They gave just 100 mils of 3%, um, and he got neurological injury. We don't really know if it was ever due to that, to be honest, because it's a pretty pissy amount of hypertonic saline. Um, and the MET team have said, just continue as if it's a normal hypovolemic hypernatremia. Okay, so just give fluid as you're going to do your thing. The water amp finishes afterwards. They say he's got a small bowel obstruction. Um, and you've got a couple of jobs you've got to do. So you've got to put him in the gene, you've got to keep him in the white mouth, and you've got to write maintenance fluids. So the registrar says, all right, water amp's over. I've got to write some maintenance fluids. What do you write up? Yeah, what do you write up? Um, normal sailing. Why? Um, just for maintenance fluids. Um, what rate? That's a good question. <laughs> How much? How long over? <coughs> yeah, it's okay. You don't know. But what's the next step you want to do before you write up a big amount of fluid for someone that's not going to be in for a while? What's the next step when everything went to registrar and nurse ask you? You don't see the patient. Right? That's exactly what you were saying. And you find him is is better. Like, because it's now hours later after the water. So he's alert, he's sitting there, he weighs 60 kilos. He's hemodynamically stable, his respiratory <coughs> stuff is fine, he's otherwise fine. NGT, someone put him in the nurse already, so that's pretty good. No real aspirates coming out, so it's pretty good there. Um, he's only got a small amount of ascites. IDC has finally been put in because he did that before. Now he's had about 50 to 80 mils a year and output per hour, so pretty good. You know, 0.5 mil per hour per kilo is what you sort of expect. So him 30 mil an hour or more, and we're pretty happy. General rule, greater than 40 yeah. So he's doing okay. And he's been positive 400 mils since admission 12 hours ago. But we not. Okay? So anyone have an idea of what they want to give now? Can you just alternate between say one or say one or CSL and then 5% of the dextro? Why would you do that? If he's not eating, and he would have stopped if not making his food close. So is that risk of hyper? Hyper or hypo? Yeah, sure. Good. That's a good theory. How much would you give and how fast? So it's one meter over eight to ten hours. Why eight to ten? Because that's about maintenance. So okay. <laughs> yeah. Day. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Look, and I'll be honest with you. I don't think I've ever, ever actually sat down and probably done this properly. But so I agree. We practice. Normal saline, eight hours, sure, whatever. He's a bit bigger. Yeah, six hours for a bit, whatever. But this is what you should be doing in theory, right? <coughs> so you know that the fluid requirements for the patient are going to be whatever their maintenance requirements are plus whatever excessive losses they have. So I'm not talking about the normal amount of urine that you see. I'm talking about the excessive losses being someone that's polyuric, like 200 mils an hour, and you're like, where the fuck is that coming from? That has to go back in there. When someone's nil by mouth, 
but every four hours when the nurse does their aspirates, they're getting 300 mil out. That probably has to go back in, okay? Not normal urine, that sort of stuff. Um, daily requirements, these numbers are just pulled out of some magic book somewhere. Um, 30 mils per kilo per day is how much fluid you need. Um, sodium, just remember it's two per kilo. Potassium, one per kilo. Pretty easy because then the numbers work out nice and, and not just for this sort of question, I guess. So looking at this guy now, does anyone have at least any idea about using those numbers before? What sort of requirements you might think of over a day? I guess it's sort of maths, I'm not going to I've written on the next page, so. But at least you get an idea, right? Well, maybe the next one. Sorry, the next one is sort of a common fluid, so that you know what you're actually giving your patient. So when you write up 0.9% mole sal, you're going to give them 150 millimoles per litre of, of sodium and no potassium. When you write up dextrose, you can give them no sodium and no potassium. And when you write up CSL or Hartman, so you're going to give them 131 of, of sodium and 5 of potassium. Okay? Now I just arbitrarily chose that this was the way I was going to give this guy fluid. What happens if he becomes hypoglycemic? I don't even think I know. If he does, I'll probably just give him some glucose. But this is the way I've decided to do it, because why not? We know that he needs 1,800 mil a day of fluid as his maintenance requirements. We know that he needs 120 millimoles per litre of sodium, and he needs 60 millimoles per litre of potassium. So just chart up whatever you want, sort of matches that. You give him a 0.9 bag of saline for 11 hours, then you give him a top up with one of those 100 mil bags that's got the 30 mil of potassium in it. Do that for another hour and that gives you 12 hours. And then you repeat it. That way he gets all his potassium. He gets a bit more sodium than what we probably want for him, but at the same time, this guy was hypoendotrenic a while ago. So we're slowly going to bring that up. And he maybe gets a touch more fluid than what we wanted for him as well. But, you know, we're close enough. That's pretty good. Yeah? Just wondering, those bags with 30 mil of litre of potassium, do you add them or are they pre-made bags that yeah, so they're pre-made. They've got they've got 30 millimole bags of potassium, magnesium that are pre-made into 100 mil bags, and then they have sometimes uh, 30 millimole bags that are in like one liter or so. So it depends. Or maybe the 10 millimoles actually 100 mil. Just think about it. Could be, yeah. Yeah. So I'm just disregard. But yeah, no, they're, they're pre-made. You don't make any new bags yourself. Just ask for it. The nurses will find them. Okay. So he stays on the ward for a couple of days now, three days. He's got no further problems. He's progressing well from the small bowel obstruction point of view. He opens his bowels overnight. So you rock up one morning. You're, it's like day six or seven for you, and you're pretty much over it. And you're getting ready for the list for the ward round because you turned up an hour early, as a good intern does. And all of a sudden, someone comes up to you and they said, oh, he's vomiting blood. It's everywhere. Get in here quick. So I won't even bother asking. I guess that probably will be what we're going to see pretty quick. So this is what you see when you get there. He's lying on the side, on his side in bed. He's jaundiced, but he looks a little bit paler compared to when you saw him previously the last couple of days. Blood-stained clothes, blood on the bed, blood on the floor. There's a bowl of bright red blood sitting next to him. 300 mil or so in it, let's just say it's that. His GCS is 14, so E4, V4, M6. The only reason he's V4 is because he's just a tiny little bit sort of confused and agitated. So he's maybe even V5, you know, but you give it V4 just for the benefit of the doubt. Slightly drowsy and anxious. His heart rate's 132, blood pressure's 114, 163. He's only got 120 gauge in his hand. He's got cool peripherals, central capital cap refills less than two seconds. He's saturated and okay, 96%, slightly tachypnic, 24. His MGT is in there, and it's been aspirating blood, so it's pulled out 500 ml of frank blood when the nurse just did it a short while ago. He's still got the ascites in his belly. His belly is soft, not tender, not perfectly cool. IDC is in there. Urine output was good overnight, 90 to 100 ml an hour, which is quite good. And all of a sudden, it's dropped in the last two hours to 20 to 30 ml. So is he sick, or is he well? Good. Why? Why? His blood pressure is down. Um, he's saturating all that. His respiratory <coughs> rate is up. Um, he's lost a lot of blood, and his urine output is going off. So he's very hypovolemic right now. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So I guess it's something that's pretty obvious, especially when you make up the case and you put numbers up there. But. The one thing, one of the things I really want to impress on you is how much the blood pressure stays the same for so many people, especially the younger ones, before they crash really, really hard. 
okay? So it's not uncommon to see the heart rate that gets up to 130, 140, and their blood pressure is still slamming. You're like, oh, this guy's going all right. I don't need to give him anything. Uh, pretend he hasn't fallen flat. But you know, like, you think, oh, they're doing all right. And then all of a sudden they crash. So when someone is that tachycardic, really any tachycardic, and they've got evidence of fluid loss, you've got to think that something's going on. Now this is just out of the ATLS course. Um, so they define hemorrhagic shock. There's four different classes. When you lose less than 750 mils of one, 750 to 1500 is two, 1500 to two liters is supposed to be, is three, and over two liters is class four. And what those basically entail, and what they give you a guideline of, is like class one is someone, they've lost a bit of blood or something, you don't really care about it, they look okay, they're not tachycardic, their blood pressure's fine, they're maintaining okay, their urine output, if you had a cat for me, it's probably okay. That's the sort of stuff you probably don't even need to treat. Right? When you get to 750 to 1500 mil, then things start getting a little bit murkier, like their heart rate's probably going up, but their blood pressure's still fine. They're probably not confused and drowsy yet, but they're probably a bit ag agitated, even if they don't know they're bleeding, so let's say it's all internally going to get a bit dumb in the later in a minute, because they're still probably getting pretty agitated. Um, and this is the level where you can start treating, and when you give something, it helps them immediately, and it probably reverts it and puts it off for a little bit, at least hemodynamically, so they're not going to crash in front of you. Once you start getting to class three, that's when they start becoming really bad. So that's when you start getting raging tachycardia and borderline blood pressure. That's when you start getting fluids that you dump in don't really seem to be doing as much. That's when these guys are confused, or even worse, they start to get really drowsy, peripheries shut down, they go cold, they go mottled. And you can imagine if that's class three, class four is absolute shit, okay? Like, you will know when you see someone class four. You don't even have to work out how much blood is everywhere. Which, by the way, is often really difficult because if you've like spilt blood, it looks like you've massacred something and it's like 10 or something. You're like, not so much. So just be aware that even though it might look like there's a lot, there's not much, but you'll know when you see like a class four because they look like absolute nuts. So going back with that sort of thing in mind, just not that you need to care about classes at all, but to give yourself an idea. Is this sort of a guy that's going to be needing massive transfusion reactions right this second because he's dropped 400 litres of blood, blah, blah, blah? Or is this someone that you could probably try fluids with? Is this someone you could probably treat, even though it's pretty serious because he's bleeding, so you're going to have to get on top of it? But is this someone you can do something about right now? I guess I led you in that pretty, pretty hard. <laughs> yeah. So I guess my point is don't call a massive transfusion reaction on this guy. Because when you do, you'll activate a whole other set of things in the hospital, and people might get a little bit annoyed at you for doing it because then it activates a lot of different departments and activates a lot of different other things. So this is someone that you can get, I think we do it next, where you start your resuscitative fluid techniques on. So you stop bleeding, and it's pretty hard for him, he's vomiting out somewhere, we don't know where it is, and we're not gonna shove something down his throat bedside. You monitor vital signs, and you get the nurses to change the blood pressure cuff things every two minutes. Because we're not nice here when we've got an art line that shows us second by second what's going on. And if you leave it, it will get left. And you'll look up and you'll be like, his blood pressure's fine, you're doing shit. His blood pressure's fine, you're doing shit. Blood pressure's fine, you're doing shit. And all of a sudden you look up and you're like, oh, that was like 15 minutes ago. What's going on? And you do the blood pressure, it's like 80 systolic. And then you look really, really bad. So make sure, first thing you do, because you rely on the numbers so much, tell them to change it. Or change it yourself if you work out. Go and play with the machines like in the first couple of weeks there and work it out. Get immediate IV access. So now again, we've already called for help. We've already done all that boring stuff, right? So whilst you're there and waiting for someone to come and save you, you're getting big cannulas into big veins. So 16, 18 gauge. Big bores, short cannulas into big veins, okay? This one, if you back wall it and then you come back out, as long as it's in and it's flushing, it's okay. Because it's not going to give anything that if it extravasates is a really big deal, it's more that it just needs to get fluid in, okay? When you do a cannula, and this is just, I guess, a bit of advice about every cannula you'll ever do, if you do a cannula, take blood out. Just use a 20 mil syringe and just take blood out. Just get into the practice of doing it. You might throw it away a lot of the time. Who cares? No one cares about 20 mil of blood. But get into the habit so that when you're in this scenario and when your mind is like, oh my God, I've got to like, give fluid and this guy's going to die and he's bleeding out and he's everywhere. Oh my God, I've got a cannula now. Or just and you forgot the bloods, and then you look like a real muppet because you don't have your FBE, you don't know what his kidneys are doing, you don't know if like what his grip and hold is if he got one. So make sure, just as a thing of practice, when you put a cannula in, take blood out, and you can always throw it away afterwards. Okay? But in this guy, you send off a few things. You want to see if he's cardiopathic, you send off LFTs because why not? He's a liver patient. You do a cross match. 
you probably don't have to do uncross matched blood at the moment, again, because we've sort of assessed that he's maybe on the borderline of class one, class two, should respond to some fluids, make him hemodynamically stable. And we know with an upper GI bleed that he's gonna probably get endoscopy in the coming like 10 minutes or something, right? So we probably don't need to activate and get O neg blood or O positive blood coming out of us right now. But you cross match some, two units, and they can, it'll have them, it'll be there for when they go to theater, okay? Then you grab your fluid. So even though we think that it's going to respond, we still have to give them some. And even though in theory you replace blood with blood or blood-like product, in, the, in this sort of case, give him crystalloid, whatever's closest. I don't care if it's normal saline, I don't care if it's CSL, I don't care if it's one of the plasma lights or something, or even if you've got cholera. If you have that because it's closest, by all means use that. Use something, give them that a litre. If you really want to push it, give them two litres, but you won't really need to. One litre will be fine before someone else comes. Okay? And run it through STAP. STAP, it's an American term, whatever. Most nurses understand it. It either means cranked up to the highest rate the pump will give, or someone stands there and squeezes the back and watches it go in. Okay? And then, of course, you've got to stop the bleed. Again, this guy we can't do much about. So what does happen is you get your 18-gauge cannula in, and you start that one bag of CSL, and it runs through pretty quickly. The MET team arrives. They put a sense stack in, and they need to make this guy. Sense stack is one of the black more tubes, expands, and stops esophageal and gastric bleed. So he goes to theatre straight away, he gets gastroscopy, they find two esophageal viruses, they ban them, get good hemostasis. He comes back to the ward, this is all in the morning, because of course this always happens just before water out. So he comes back to the ward, you haven't seen him at all, but he's safe, he's secure, anaesthetics have seen him, gastro have seen him, they've topped him up, it's all good. They want BD blood on him, because they want to make sure his hemoglobin is not dropping. Um, and then of course you're staying back until 7 p.m., you're doing a discharge something, for whatever reason. And the nurse comes over and she interrupts you. She's like, did you know your force potassium is high, 6.2? Just wondering if you want to know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm being a yeah, disparaging, but they sometimes do that. Um, so who cares about that? Yeah. Why? Yeah, sure. All right, fine. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, check the patient. I had that for some there. So he's sitting in bed, he's awake and alert. He's here with that happy state. He's got the big cannula in his arms. He's being extubated as well. Fucking phenomenal, isn't it? That's pretty good, okay? Um, so he's, he's doing quite well on room air. Uh, he's MGT, they put one in the theatre, which is fine, or in the you know, scope room. No aspirates, abdomen's fine. IDC is in, he's getting a good amount of urine out, he's doing all right. So do we still care? Do we still care? All right, so that's the ECG we get. So, again, <coughs> I don't know about you guys, but when I went through med school and internship and all of this year so far, I felt even useless at ECGs. Like I can tell if a heart is on or if it's off, and that's about it. Okay. <laughs> so when someone tells you, look at this ECG, you know how like you always get those like registrars, they look at it in a second, they're like, oh, it's obviously a little bit. Come on, like, how, how did you do like the P waves? And is it like what rate is it? And pure interval. And... So it's a bit of a new thing I want you to do. When you look at an ECG, look for anything that is ragingly abnormal. Okay. If there's nothing that's ragingly abnormal, then that ECG can be sat down and looked at over half an hour. And if a registrar gets it quick, it's fine. But if you miss something that's ragingly abnormal, then you might look like an idiot. And if you're stuck doing like the PR interval and you still got the tall tented T waves, you look like an idiot, right? So ragingly abnormal, tall tented T waves. Does anyone see that by the way? Because I, I don't mean to be disparaging at all because I'm useless. Like I know it's tented T waves because I Google searched tall tented T waves, right? But can everyone see how high the T's are? Look at like V2 through to V4. And in particular, have a look at V6. Look how the T wave is basically as high as the QRS complex. Okay? So I've identified as ECG chambers. And now we can get on to actual hypercleaning. So why do we care about an ECG, I guess? Um, the first thing you do with any hypokalemia patient is repeat the bloods. And it's not to say that you're not going to treat someone. Because if you get a potassium above six, or you have ECG changes, I would still probably treat them straight away. But you do have to be careful, because sometimes these will get done late at night by someone that's not really that good at taking blood, or in someone that doesn't have big veins or has problems. So they put a tourniquet on, and they leave it there for like three hours. Not quite three hours, but you know, they leave it there forever, and they're hunting for a vein, and they get that small dribble, trickle of blood, and you're like, oh. You know, it's pretty crappy blood. They send it off and the potassium's like 400. Of course it is, like it's normalized. So don't just treat it based on one alone. And I say, a 
I don't think I'm going to discredit that in my very next sentence because I'm going to say if it's above six, you probably should think about treatment anyway. But I guess as long as you have in mind what your goals of treatment are, then you have an idea whilst you're waiting for that repeat blood to come back. So this is probably medical school stuff, whatever. Membrane, sta membrane stabilization, redistribution, elimination, work out and treat the underlying cause, right? They're the four things you do with any hyperkalemia patient. You don't care about the third one because you're into it. Don't worry about it. It's not your problem. Someone else can work out why it's hyperkalemia. You've got to do the first three. Uh, talk about ECG is fine. Okay, so ECG findings. So these are the ECG findings that you get. And these are, in theory, when you read books, the progression. You get a shortened QT interval, then you get the tall tens of T waves, the QRS becomes a bit longer, the P wave does funny things, it sort of gets closer and then it becomes really small, then you get this cool sine wave ECG and then they go V fib asystole, right? In reality, it does not happen like that. So if you have someone, you can have someone that's sitting on the ward with a potassium of nine, and they have no ECG changes. I wouldn't leave them there like that, but they, they don't have an ECG change when you do it, right? And then all of a sudden, you get someone, and they've got this disgusting sine wave ECG, they're hemodynamically unstable, some bright consultant in the ED goes, hmm, I reckon they're hyperkalemic, we'll give them the insulin, the glucose, give them calcium, all of a sudden they resolve, and you, their blood comes back, the potassium is like 6.2, right? Like, the fuck, like, I'm sure I've seen, like, really bad ones. So the ECG is great, and you get it. But don't let that, don't let the lack of an ECG finding dictate what you're going to do, okay? Especially because, like we've sort of just said, the ones that you'll be able to see are the peak T waves, sure. You'll be able to see uh, at a glance when it becomes a sine wave ECG, sure, that's pretty bad. But all the other ones, are you really going to sit there and work out the QT interval? Probably not. So don't rely on the ECG. If there's changes, treat, but don't rely on it. And of course, our treatment, membrane stabilization. So it antagonizes the excitatory effect of the potassium and the cardiac cell membrane, that stupid like up down diagram. And, Potassium, and when you get hyperkalemia, that whole diagram shifts upwards because potassium, like the load, is too high. And essentially, calcium is like an antagonist. So, just think of that one. The two that you use calcium chloride, calcium gluconate. One's three times as strong as the other. Okay? Of course, there are some differences. Calcium gluconate is probably the one that you'll use most likely on the wards in the intern. Why? Because it can be given through a proof of IV pretty safely. Anything you can run D5W through, you can run this through. Okay? So, a little crappy IV in the back of the hand, you can probably take the calcium glucose, even if it extravasates a little bit. It needs liver function to metabolize. Although, having said that, there's like a, a paper that was done relatively recently, like four or five years ago, that says that maybe you don't. So, take that with a word of caution. I wouldn't necessarily say that every end stage liver failure or cirrhotic needs to have calcium chloride, but just even if you mention it, think it out loud, and someone sent by those ones, pretty smart. Um, don't give it as a push, so don't give it like slam it in over sort of 10 seconds because they can get like a reflex hypotensive episode and it doesn't really look that good when they do that and you don't know whether it's actually then their hyperkalemia and some sort of, you know, cram like crazy heart rate problem has caused it, so you get pretty scared. So just give it slow and when I say slow, all I mean is you either give it to a nurse or a medical student and you say, over the next two minutes push that in and they just sit there and go, <laughs> right, that's all. <laughs> Um, and now we get to the calcium chloride. So the calcium chloride advantage can be given over a bit of a quicker push. So I've said once two minutes there, you can actually, if you need to, just slam it right in. And it doesn't have that same sort of hemodynamic instability effect. Okay? Doesn't need the liver to metabolize, classically, because when it hits the blood, it immediately dissociates and gives you ionized calcium. Um, however, you need a really, really good peripheral IV. So nothing in the back of the hand. I don't care how good it is, nothing in the back of the hand. Probably nothing even in the forearm, because those veins, even though they can be big, have often been stabbed a few times and there's a lot of problems. So those ones you're requiring either big, like anticubular fossa veins, or central lines of some sort. Okay? Just because when that stuff gets out, the tissue around it becomes absolutely destroyed. And you don't want to give someone a necrotic leave. Um, now, obviously, the other thing, so because obviously you don't use calcium chloride, the thing that I want you to remember with the gluconate is the rule of tens. So, 10%, 10 mils of it over 10 minutes. Again, I say 10 minutes. You can give it probably like a bit quicker with that medical student pushing it because you're probably pretty worried. But that's it, rule of 10s and you're fine. 10%, 10 mil, 10 minutes, okay? The other thing to remember, and this is probably again nothing that you'll ever have to deal with because someone will be there or someone will help. But if it wasn't that high in the first place and you were just treating it because you felt like you needed to treat a number, it's only going to last about 30 to 60 minutes. So this is not someone you can 
giving calcium chloride, giving dextrose insulin, walk away and be like, yeah, I've done that. Because it'll come back. Like, this will all wear off. And when it comes back and you haven't done anything again, then you look like a real idiot because you've identified a problem, you started treatment, and then you walked away from it. Okay? So these guys, you come back and you check on them in an hour and see how they're going after you've done this. So that's the first part, the membrane stabilizing. The second part that you do is redistribution. So we all know that you move potassium from the serum into the intracellular space. The way you give this is 50%, 50 mil, 50% dextrose, 50 mils of it in 10 units of insulin <coughs> IV. It's the only time you'll use insulin IV, okay? And obviously infusions and stuff like that put aside. As an intern, it's the only time you use it IV. So everything else is subcut. But do not put this subcut because it won't work. And for God's sake, don't give someone like an insulin sliding scale IV because you look like an idiot. They won't do it, but you'll look dumb when someone reads the actual chart. And just a tip when you actually give this, the dextrose syrup is thick. So you get that 50 ml of it, and you get someone to push it in, and they give it, they either push in or they set it up in the infusion bag or whatever you want, right? But they give it to them over a relatively slow time. And the other thing you then do is you get that 10 ml of insulin, uh, sorry, 10 units of insulin, and it's tiny. Like if you guys have seen the actual diabetic like insulin injectors, they have like 400 units in like a little tiny syringe this big. So drawing up 10, mil, 10 units is ridiculously small. But you get that, you mix it in with a 10 mil syringe of saline, shake that thing of saline around, so you've got 10 mil of saline with your 10 units in there, and push that through the cannula. And then follow up with a flush if you want. And at least you make sure that all that 10 units gets in, okay? Now, like I say, you can actually give it after the dextrose, before the dextrose, whatever you want, really, as long as you're giving them both relatively at the same time, okay? And check the BSL in one hour. So when you come back to check on that patient again to work out if you still need to do everything, just do a finger prick for the BSL. Or tell the nurse, in one hour, do a finger prick. Because you don't want your patient to then go into, like, a coma. And you're like, oh, really? Hyperglycemia? Like, I did that before. You look really bad, right? So make sure that you check it again in an hour. And if there's a problem, if it's low, just give them a of 50%. Okay, so it runs high for a bit, whatever, no one's going to die from that. Five months, except. But you know, whatever, right? It'll be fine. The other thing you can do, not as common, um, is to give salbutamol. And the only reason I say it's not as common is because it's a bit of a weird dose. So when you write up your normal salbutamol NEMs, they're five milligrams into a NEM, the dose of this is four times as much. Some nurses will do it, some nurses won't. You'll write it down, it won't get done because they're not used to doing it. So I tend to not do that one. And also because it gives you a reflex tachycardia. And it's not necessarily something that you want in all your patients if you're going to avoid it with dextrose and insulin. And the last one is elimination. So, so far, all we've done is we've bought our soft time, right? And then we have to actually get rid of the potassium. So, the way that you will do it most often is with diabetics. So, give them 40 of frisamide. If they're hypervolemic, give them 40, give them another 40 a little bit after, it's fine. If they're euvolemic or they're hypovolemic, give them 40, give them 80, whatever you feel like, and then you give them fluid, so you replace it, okay? That way, you're going to get rid of it, and that's what we need to get rid of all the potassium. There's hemodialysis, so that will be pretty much reserved for people with some sort of chronic kidney disease that can't actually renally excrete their potassium. Any patients with like refractory hyperkalemia that's not really working with any of your treatments, or any patient that your boss just says has to have dialysis, he's big enough to say has to have dialysis. So that'll happen. Sodium bicarb, don't worry about it. Nothing you'll ever deal with. And then risonium. Um, so I'll go on to a bit of a rant about risonium, and I'm sorry, and I apologize. But risonium is useless. I'm, I'll tell you right now, it's absolutely useless. There'll be consultants that swear by it. Um, and what it is, in case you want, it's this, it's this resin. It was basically made as like an industrial, like concreting sort of resin thing. Someone decided, Oh, if it gets rid of all the cations, why don't we like make people eat it? That sounds like a great idea. They added something to make it go through a bit quicker, which is why we give people a zone when they get the runs, because they've got all this other stuff added to it. And what it will do is it sits in the gut and it binds any cation. So potassium, magnesium, calcium, hydrogen, anything that's positively charged will bind to this. Okay? So not very selective. And then this is for when the registrar says, well, you should use only you want to argue with them, look really good to the consultant. You say, you know, it was actually based on two trials done in the New England Journal of Medicine in 61. And I'm not sure, you have all the research, huh? Like, just now. So you guys actually know how hard it is to actually get something published. Imagine going today and saying, all right, I've got a study for you. There's five patients that I'm going to give this thing to. And I mean, there's three that I'm going to keep as my control group, right? And what I'm going to do is to assess 
how to treat critical hyperkalemia that we need to resolve in minutes. I'm going to measure the potassium once. I'm going to give five people one drug, three people something else. And then I'm going to leave them on a potassium sparing diet for five days. I'm going to give them a sugar full diet, so they're going to have the hypoglycemic effect as well of producing their own insulin. And on top of it, I'll only measure the potassium five days later. And in fact, it turns out that the guys that didn't have it did better. Right? So that's what that's what it's based on. When you give risonium, that's what you're basing it on. Evidence based medicine. Yeah, how good is that? <laughs> also, it looks like it's pretty easy to publish in the 60s. And the other one's not much better. Like, there were a few more patients, great, but there's no control group. They basically did, gave everyone the exact same thing, also gave them a potassium sparing diet and gave them sugar as well. So, well, surprise, surprise, what do we do with patients? Right? And all of a sudden, they found that 23 of them out of 30, we don't know where two went, they disappeared in the article, uh, just still gone, vanish. Um, had a drop of four like milli equivalents per litre over 24 hours. So it's not that useful, right? And again, there have been other studies that have shown more recently that in fact, on a whole, it's pretty useless. And the problem is, if something's useless, sure you can give it, you know, but I guess the do no harm part is the part that you have to take into the equation. And the problem with this is it can give people life-threatening complications. It can actually cause concretions within their bowel, of their feces, that then leads to necrotic bowel, and they die. So, is it really worth it? I don't know. Yeah, that's my rant about. So, so um, anyway, in the end, what you did, you gave him the 10 mil of calcium gluconate. Um, you gave him the dextrose insulin and gave him some furosemide in two separate sort of boluses because you have the IV therapy running already from the theater. Um, the critical hyperkalemia resolves. Um, he's, he was found to have been given multiple bags overnight of the um, hyperkalemic solution um, because some charged resin that didn't have any <coughs> so he was going to write maintenance for all with potassium. Um, he makes an uneventful recovery and he goes on. Alright? And I think that's probably, it could be about it actually. Yeah, that's it. Any questions at all? So after you give the, the insulin, mm. do you always have to give prismite as well? Or if they okay, so let me to save myself from having to answer a question and ask you, what do you do if you're giving someone calcium and you give them the dextrose and the insulin and you don't give them the fruit what have you done for them? So you've shifted the potassium into the cell, so I suppose you haven't really actually gotten rid of any of them. Yeah, you haven't done anything. That's it. Yeah, you're buying yourself time, but you haven't done anything. So that's why. You're giving them the fruit because it excretes the potassium. That's all. Yeah. You can, if they're on dialysis, that'll do it for you, and they shouldn't be hyperkalemic clinic, whatever. But if they've got a big fast cat in there in ICU, you can just be like, look, if you come on dialysis, don't do it. Or you give them rosanium and give them rock hard shit, but then dive them down on the other. So yeah, as long as you remember today, I guess the topics were sort of fluid management, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and emergency resuscitation, like with regards to sort of fluids initially. That's all stuff that you get out today. Hopefully. That's it.